Welcome to the Blogger Genius Podcast brought to you by Milo Tree. Here's your host, Jillian Leslie. Hello, my friends. Welcome back to the Blogger Genius Podcast. I am your host, Jillian Leslie. I am so grateful that you are here. I'm a serial entrepreneur, and it is my mission to help creators grow online businesses. I thought I would start with a quick thank you to all our new Milo Tree Cart customers. So people have heard me talk about it. It's the easiest way to sell digital products. They've gone to MiloTreeCart.com, signed up for their free accounts, created products, have created sales pages, have started selling workshops, memberships, coaching, digital downloads. It is so exciting to watch. And the feedback I am hearing is that people love how easy it is to use. They love the free sales pages with the fill in the blank templates. They love that they don't pay anything until they start making money. Therefore, they're able to test quick, easy, and often. If you have an audience and you are not selling products and services directly to them, you are missing out on thousands of dollars and it is so much easier to set up than you can imagine. So please head to MiloTreeCart.com, sign up for your free account. If you want to start with a paid workshop, get my download to come up with your workshop idea at MiloTree.com slash workshop idea, but start putting up products, putting up sales pages, going directly to your audience and selling them. And this is how you start building your digital product empire. For today's episode, I have Molly Mandelberg on the show and her business is called Wild Hearts Rise Up. And I love this. Check it out. She coaches spiritual women entrepreneurs. So these are coaches, healers, spiritual practitioners, and guess what? They need businesses. They need a way to get their messages out. And this is what Molly does. And she's a, she's a nomad. She travels around and has a van and lives in her van and teaches people virtually how to turn those dreams into businesses. It was a really fun conversation. I think you're going to really like it. We talk a lot about the systems. She recommends creatives, spiritual women put in place to actually make serious money doing what they're doing. So without further delay, here is my interview with Molly Mandelberg. Molly, welcome to the Blogger Genius Podcast. Hi, thanks for having me. We were introduced by another female entrepreneur. We got on a Zoom call and, and you have a podcast, I have a podcast, and we're like, hey, let's introduce each other to our audiences. So I'm super happy that you are here. And will you share what you do and how you got started and even about your nomadic life, which I find so fascinating? Yeah, totally. So um, I work mostly with uh, spiritual women entrepreneurs, mostly coaches and healers, holistic practitioners, people who are really great at what they do, but for whatever reason, they don't love talking about what they do, or they don't have the messaging or the technology pieces in place to really broadcast their message on a grand scale. So I help those people to craft their deep work into inspiring content and hot copy and to tackle the technology necessary so that they can reach more people and make more money and a bigger impact with less time spent. And I've been doing this. Um, I started my business about seven years ago. Um, it's called wild hearts raise up. I don't know if I said that already. And, um, yeah, I, I now get to live my dream of traveling the world full time. I run um, seven or eight different online programs and courses throughout the year and um, really bridge that world between the heart centered practitioner who needs to convey a message, but has a bunch of limitations around marketing or broadcasting or using technology or automation to show up in the world. And I sort of bring them into the businessy side of things so that they can actually make that difference that they're here to make. And um, if you had told me 10, 15 years ago that I would be teaching something along the lines of marketing, I would have probably laughed in your face. I've been nomadic and kind of a hippie vagabond for most of my life. And um, I started my business doing hypnotherapy. 
and quickly realized that I was not really interested in talking slow and doing that induction process, but I had a deep passion for healing and I had a deep passion for creation and content and, and making things that people could um, learn and grow from. And through my own we meandering path of entrepreneurship, I sort of found my way to um, getting really good at these systems, sales funnels, email marketing, setting up content, making it easy for people to find us. And um, yeah, now I get to run my six figure business from the back of a sprinter van that I turned into a tiny home and I travel the world full time. That is so inspiring. And um, I, you, as I was sharing with you before we pressed record, you're the third woman I have interviewed on my podcast who is living this nomadic life. And I think that my we have a, a daughter and she's in high school now. And so that's my dream for my husband and me. Like when she goes to college, like we will go travel the world and work anywhere. So I look to people like you who've gone before me and go, you know, what's it really like? So what is it really like traveling the world by yourself? And um, I don't know, living that nomadic life. I mean, it's beautiful. It's wonderful. There's lots of like freedom and in, laid into it. And there's definitely more, um, I don't want to call it admin, but there's more like managing of your life that needs to be done than when you live in a house. Like, where are you going to sleep tonight? Where's the next shower you're going to get? Where's the next Wi Fi or good signal that you're going to use to take calls and run your business? All of that is sort of, uh, a luxury that you don't re really, you usually take for granted if you live in a house and you stay in one place. So there's more sort of details of life to manage, but the payoff of getting to wake up in beautiful places and getting to spend more time with your loved ones who maybe don't live in the same place as you, um, it's, yeah, it's beautiful and wonderful. And I absolutely love it. What's interesting, a couple things. One, you know your niche. Your niche yeah. are female, heart-centered, um, spiritual women who do not like to sell. Maybe they also uh, have more of, um, they're probably less, kind, they're more creative, less kind of um, mentally organized. Like when yeah. I work with, so we work with a lot of similar people, creative women, and they too have an aversion for selling. Um, they want to put beautiful things out into the world, make the world a better place. And sometimes I say like with that creativity comes a like with the ability to see all these disparate things and bring them together, they can have what I call a little bit of a messy mind. And they do well when we kind of strip it down and talk about systems that they can wrap their brains around. Yeah. Just streamline it for them. Totally. Yeah. And, and I have found, oh, I was just going to say changing the messaging from selling, selling is icky to selling is service has been super helpful. I think yeah. just in my That's own really evolution yeah. and in guiding others. Totally. And so how yeah. do you think about that messaging? How do you get these creative women who aren't necessarily thinking about the bottom line how do you get them to start digging in and thinking about things like marketing and sales and funnels and money? Yeah, it really comes back to that mindset shift that this isn't about selling, that you are not a used car salesman, that you're not actually trying to coerce anyone into purchasing something that is not necessary to them. What you're trying to do is broadcast the beauty of the work that you're doing so that the people who have been searching for that kind of support can find it and get the support that they need. And the doing the marketing and the learning how to sell is really just opening that doorway so that those people can get the services and the support that they really require. And that makes it a totally different game. It's not about you selling yourself. It's about you opening the door so that the people who need the healing that you've mastered can actually receive it. I was on a call with a woman who is a counselor and she helps women get out of abusive relationships. And she has all those same blocks in terms of selling and why would I do that? And it sounds so icky. And I said to her, like you, there are women who need you. So it's no longer about you. Yeah. 
if you can help one woman get out of an abusive relationship, you need to be doing this. So shrink yourself down. Nobody cares about you, but you, you are needed in the world. And I think for her, it was like a, oh yeah, nobody can, like, it's not me. It's what I can provide for others. And I think that was a really, it, it was interesting to watch her switch that in her brain in real time. Yeah, totally. I think that's a really great distinction. And there's a book, I think, I think it's called rocket fuel, but I could be thinking of the wrong book title, but it talks about the difference between the visionary and the implementer. And you talked about the creative people who kind of have quote unquote, a messy mind. It's really a different kind of mind. The visionary has these beautiful ideas. They have the capacity to synthesize like a bird's eye view of a problem or an issue or a challenge that's occurring. And then come up with solutions or come up with like metaphors and ways that this can be transformed in someone's life. And any visionary needs an implementer to follow through with their plan. And the problem I think with solopreneurs is we think we have to wear every single hat in our business. And if somebody's not naturally an implementer, then it's important to find people who can help you implement. And I think that's why what you and I do is so important is that those creative visionary minds need support with the implementation process. And it isn't easy to come by for someone who doesn't think that way already. And I, I think, think that's, yeah, one of the things that people, my clients really love for me is that simplification of, it seems like a lot to have to implement all these aspects of our business. But really, if, the, if you have the right system in place, or if you know what the pieces of the puzzle actually are, then it gets a lot simpler. Now, here's the thing that I would say, I notice when I'm talking to people like this, super creatives is they're kind of nomadic in that they don't want to keep showing up and doing the crappy stuff. Like the new idea, the sparkly new thing is so exciting to them and so intoxicating that to go, Hey, you need to be posting consistently on Instagram or Pinterest or whatever, or working on SEO or whatever these things are that, to be honest with you, are not fun. They're like the, you know, like sweeping the floors of the store at the end of the day. Like somebody's got to sweep the floors. And if you're a solopreneur, that's you. And I find there's resistance from creative entrepreneurs who are like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I'm not going to sweep the floors because I got too many cool ideas to go work on. And so there are lots of starts to things and not a lot of finishing. Yeah, totally. And how do you speak to that? Yeah, we call that the shiny object syndrome. It's like, I want to start everything because the the new idea is so sexy and exciting and I want to move in that direction. And there's a couple of things that I recommend for that. One is if you are seeing clients and you're making a little bit of money to start uh, systemizing what you're doing in your business that you're tired of doing. So what are the sweeping jobs or the vacuuming jobs that you're, you're capable of and you've been managing, but that you're kind of sick of and starting to process that in such a way that you can hand that off to a virtual assistant. So I'm a big fan of learning how to delegate as early on in your business as possible so that you can spend more of the time doing the parts that you really love and less of the time doing that admin stuff that maybe needs to get done or even onboarding. I mean, there's so many pieces of the puzzle that need that that can be handed off if there, there isn't a passion for it by the person running the business. That's one side of things. Another side of things is the automation. So tools like you guys create in your business, the Milo tree stuff, finding things that will work for you. So finding mm-hmm. an email platform that's going to auto send emails for you. So your list is being nurtured in the background. You don't have to worry about that on a regular basis, or even using, if you are marketing on social media, using a scheduler, so you sit down and spend a couple hours a week or a couple hours a month creating a few posts and they can go out in the background from a scheduler that just posts them. And then you can show up on social media to engage with people if you want to, but then you're still visible and present on those platforms if you want to be without that being a daily stressor or regular thing that you have to manage. And again, if you're the visionary, the creative, you can create the content and have a virtual assistant or someone else to manage the publication or the posting or the broadcasting of that. For example, I have two podcasts 
the only reason I can manage that much content creation and output is because I'm only recording the podcast. My virtual assistant is doing every other aspect of that job for me. So it's really Mm. easy for me to be consistent on those platforms because I'm only doing the part that's fun. Okay. And I'm handing that off. How though do, but even so, let's say I've got like a bunch of VAs and all this stuff. One, I still have to set up all the systems. And two, there is still some sweeping that has to happen, like your taxes or whatever. How do you speak to creative entrepreneurs who have shiny object syndrome, who kind of, there's a little bit of, like I have a 15 year old daughter, you know? And sometimes she'll be like, I don't want to do this or whatever it is, like homework or something. And I'll be like, sorry, you got to. So there is an element of tough love too, that kind of like, okay, yeah, you can hire VAs, but at some point though, you've got to put together these, like nobody else is going to be able to write in your voice and set up some emails and stuff. Oh, so how do you, you speak? You definitely write in other people's voices. I do copywriting for many of my clients. But okay. But if there is that stuff and you have to get this person to sweep yeah. the floor once a week, what do you yeah. say to them? Yeah. Well, I mean, having accountability and support are the two main components to following through with something. So if you are, for whatever reason, pushing this, I just led this on a workshop yesterday. If you keep something on your to-do list and you're not doing it and you're not doing it and you're not doing it, it either needs to be broken down into smaller bites so that you don't feel like this huge task is like so overwhelming. Give yourself 10 minute blocks instead of hour blocks to work on something, make it smaller, make it easier to feel like you're making progress on it in the meantime, and then accountability and support. What kind of accountability can you create? Is that a coach or a mentor? Is it a friend that you hop on a co-working call where you're like, Hey, I'm working on this. I need you to sit there with me so that I just stay here for a minute. There are so many ways to create that accountability, even letting know, letting someone you love know, Hey, I'm going to finish this project by the end of this week. Will you ask me about it on Friday? and create that kind of accountability system for yourself so that there's some feedback loop or some uh, support system involved in you following through on that task. And that being said, I am also a big uh, advocate for following the energy. If something is on your to-do list and it just isn't alive, in my opinion, what I tell my clients to do is that doesn't have to have your attention right now. It's really possible, it's really true, that every project has its divine birth date, in my opinion. And some things need to gestate longer than others. Mm -hmm. So if it's not coming out, if there's no energy behind it, that project might not need to come to life right now. And it's Mm -hmm. better to focus your energy where the project is alive, where there's some kind of um, passion for it still, and let that other idea still live. It can be written down somewhere. If you have ideas about it, write them down but it may not be the one that needs to come forward right now. And learning how to trust yourself and follow that energy creates so much more fulfillment and aliveness and creativity in the process of creating your business that I don't think forcing something that isn't uh, energized for you right now is the best way to run a business. Mm -hmm. I think that can lead to burnout really easily. So I like that. I feel like you're saying when you have to do the sweeping of the floors, really like approach it in potentially three ways. Is there a way to break it down even smaller, doable? Like don't yeah. hold yourself to such a high standard where you can make progress Two, potentially find somebody to hold you accountable, even to say, I'll pay you. T- if I don't finish this, I'm paying you $20 at the end of the week. So <laughs> I don't want to pay you $20. So this will hopefully motivate me. And three or is take also- me out to dinner. If I follow through with this, exactly. Like, there could be a reward or risk. Sure. Right. And three is also check in with yourself that maybe this isn't the right project at this time, but make sure you're not just pushing it aside because you just want to, you know, watch Netflix, but you're actually working on the pieces that feel like they are aligned with you at this moment. Yeah. Yeah. And I'll add to that too, that is there a way to get support with the thing? So is is this something, are you pushing it off because you really don't have the tools or the um, capacity to follow through with the whole thing and it makes you uncomfortable. So could you get mentorship? Could you get a coach? Could you get a course or a program? Is there some part of research that needs to be done so that you feel more competent to follow through with the task? I mean, that would be the fourth thing I would add to that list. I like that. Support if support is required. 
So if we were to just be down and dirty and I say, I throw something out and I go, okay, who, what's your favorite email service provider that you recommend people use? What would you say? Active campaign. At really? Interesting. Yeah, I love it. Really? Yeah. I use active campaign and I have to say, not always a fan, but okay. I would say mail or light would be my go-to. I use that as well, but I use active campaign the most. Um, yeah. Okay. Scheduler for social media. Uh, I use Hootsuite, but I know Later is becoming better and better. Last okay. time I checked out Later was a long time ago, but um, Hootsuite's a great option. It should be free for three accounts or less. And if you have more than that, then you have to pay for it. Okay. Now, what about in terms of, do, do you use something like Trello or Asana yeah. or I use all Monday? I use, I use Trello for my work with my clients to keep track of our projects together. I use ClickUp for my work with my virtual assistants to keep track of my business and all the projects I have going on. Um, I have used Asana, but I switched over from that to ClickUp for my work with my VAs. Okay. And I use Slack to communicate with my team. I use WhatsApp to communicate with my groups of clients. Yeah, I use all the tools. Okay, okay. Well, that that is very helpful. Sure. And then when you are looking to hire VAs, where do you go? I use Upwork and I actually have a blog post and a podcast episode about how to hire a virtual assistant. And I also just created a course about that too, how to delegate and onboard and create systems of operations and have a hiring a VA and using the VA be a really streamlined process. But Upwork.com, I recommend two main things. One, make a list of all those sweeping jobs of your business before you go on there. So you can actually say, hey, here are the technologies that I use, the kind of tasks I need support with. Reply to this, letting me know what experience you have with those. And in that job posting, I always include a culture outline mm, for my what business. Is that? What does that mean? It's like my values, the kind of team ethics I want to uphold with somebody who comes onto my team, really the heart and soul of my business and how mm. I want somebody who comes onto my team to feel alignment with that. And I ask them when they reply, when they reply to the job posting to, to let me know what they think of that culture outline so that I know that first off, they can follow directions because they read that part. And second, that they are in alignment with that culture outline so that I know somebody who's going to come to work with me and that I'm going to be dealing with on a daily or weekly basis is going to be of the vibe, which I know is really important for businesses like the clients that I work with. While we're talking about systems and tools, I want to recommend you install our Milo Tree pop-up app on your blog or website. With our pop-up app, you can grow your followers on Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, Pinterest, and wait for it, TikTok. Plus, you can grow your email subscribers and you can add a custom link and send your visitors wherever you want them to go. Best part, will not slow your site down. Super easy to install. We offer a WordPress plugin and you get your first 30 days free. So head to milotree.com and sign up now and start growing your followers and subscribers on autopilot. Now back to the show. Okay, do you recommend finding one person and giving that person multiple tasks or do you recommend hiring people for a specific task? So you've got your podcast person or your social media person or things like that. How do you think about it? Personally, I like having one person that can do multiple things. And I think when you're starting out, managing multiple people gets kind of confusing. So I would start with what are the most important things that you need to get done that you really don't want to do with yourself and have a test task. So when I go on Upwork, I maybe give two or three people a test task. So off of that list that I've made of all the sweeping jobs, I'll give one to a different one to each person. And in that test task process, I'm asking them to basically do a thing. We'll see how long it takes them. We'll see how communication with them goes. Do they ask questions if they feel stuck? Do they need more information? It's also a good learning um, point for you to notice, did I give enough direction for this job to get done the way I want it to get done? And then um, you see how it is working with them. How is the communication? How is the follow through? How quickly did they get it done? And in that process, you can sort of weed out 
this one feels better than this one, or this job got done better than that one and find one, or if you like more than one, you can maybe hand off tasks to different ones. The thing about virtual assistants is most of them would rather have less clients and do more work for one client. So if you can create a really great relationship with one virtual assistant and just keep adding more time to that relationship, Mm. it's a good thing. It's nice to have somebody you don't have to retrain. And one of the things I teach my clients is to create that system of operations folder. So if I hand off a new task to my virtual assistant, at this point, I tell her, ask her to make the SOP, the system of operations or standard operating procedures file for the task I'm messaging her about. And now I've got this treasure trove of all the tasks that have ever been done for my business by a virtual assistant. If I lose my virtual assistant, a new person can come in and just follow those steps. I never have to train anyone ever again to do the same Mm. job. Mm. So that's a really key piece when you're hiring a virtual assistant is to start building that folder. So what I typically do is I record my screen and my voice and go through the task the way that I want somebody to do it. But I'm not necessarily say directing it at you, Molly, because I know you might not work out or who knows. So I just end up making these generic videos going now I click here to do this. And then this is how I'd like to fill this in or whatever. And then I have the video. And then if it doesn't work with that VA, I can then direct the VA to somebody. I can say, hey, new VA, here's the video. Yeah, exactly. And then you've got this thing to continue to go back to as a resource. Yeah, that's an amazing way to do it. That's the way I do it for a new task. Usually if it's something complicated or I have my VA make the steps as she's figuring out a new task. Or there's an amazing app called Tango, which is a Mm. Google Chrome plugin. And Tango will basically screen record for you, take snapshots of where you've clicked and make the written out instructions. So you could Mm. actually, you know, go on Zoom by yourself, screen share, press record, make that video of you doing the thing. And if you want to simultaneously have Tango running and it will get you, give you the written instructions of the same video. Oh, I will definitely be Very checking cool. checking out Tango. Now, about how much should I assume I'm going to pay a VA per hour? It really depends on their expertise. So if you're having somebody do regular admin stuff, you can pay anywhere from 5 to $25 an hour. Um, you can also pay people by project. And if you're having a more um, catered skill set. Like if you're having somebody run Facebook ads for you, it might cost more than that. It might be a higher monthly rate instead of a hourly or per project rate. And it just depends on what you're having people do, how specialized their skill sets are, and also what country they're working in. So Mm -hmm. if you're somebody who really only wants to hire somebody in America, you're going to pay a little bit more than say somebody who works in the Philippines and can live on less. Um, Mm -hmm. My recommendation is pay someone what they're asking for And if you love them, give them a raise every three to six months. Mm. So if you find somebody who maybe doesn't charge what a normally hourly rate is in your part of the world, let them choose their rate. And then if they're awesome, go up to a higher rate and then it feels good for everybody. Mm. Now, given that you work with predominantly women who are more, again, not as motivated by money, even though they need to be thinking about money. But they believe in things like, I'm sure, like the law of attraction, what you put out, you get back. Um, How do you coach these healers, people with more kind of intuition to attract the right clients and customers to you? Because I could see it going one of two ways. Like one, you need to put these systems in place and you need to be maybe running ads or who knows what. Or two, you kind of open to the universe and say, whatever, you know, people who need me will find me. So how do you kind of think about that? Yeah. I mean, it's both sides are very important. And I work with my clients on both sides. One side is how, who is it that you actually want to be in a room with for the next three to five years? Who is it that you actually want to be having this conversation with or doing your special magic trick with? And how can we best communicate with them? So what are the messaging pieces? What are the platforms we might find them on? What are the 
things they desire most or their things they're most challenged by? And how can we communicate that so that your soulmate clients feel so seen by the language that you're putting out there? Mm. So that's the first side. And then of course the technology and the pieces of the puzzle come into place of how are we going to broadcast that message out into the world? The other side of it, the law of attraction side of it is I've seen clients who both set up, you know, all the things we should set up so that the message can take off or the program can get sold or the packages, the consults can get booked or whatever. And somebody will have a magnetic success and somebody will have less. And so that made me have to go back to my original set of tools of hypnotherapy and my chosen modality of um, healing and transformation in my own life, which is access consciousness and look at what is the internal limitation or the energetic block that happens that keeps a message from being found or keeps a business from taking off or keeps that momentum from getting built and the traction getting found. And we look at that side of it too, is how are you energetically aligning with what you're asking for? If you say you want to make $10,000 a month, or you say you want to get three clients this month, how can we energetically line up with that and beat the drum of I'm worthy of receiving this. I deserve to be found. I'm willing to have people show up and pay me what I'm worth Mm. and, and sync up to that so that you're beaming out, as you said, what we put out, we return, we get back. How are we lining up to our own truth so that we're beaming and broadcasting that and what I call turning the magnets all the way on so that our people can find us and we can actually receive them when they show up. Now, what do you think the deep blocks are that you see over and over again show up? Yeah. I mean, they're very worthy. Those kinds of like, those kinds of like, what would you say the main narratives are that you help women push through? I'm not good enough. I don't know enough. Um, That's too much. I'm too much. I'll be judged if I do this Mm. or um, I'm, you know, just the lack of belief in oneself or the doubt that it's, that it's possible that I'm capable or that uh, people actually need this. And so we have to move through those. So to sort of line back up. So how would, let's say I'm experiencing that, right? I don't feel worthy. I don't feel like I should charge, you know, a lot of money for what I'm offering. Maybe I don't fully, flooded. Yeah, yeah. right. Too much competition. Uh, maybe I don't feel like an expert at this. So I feel like a poser, like imposter syndrome. So what would you say to me? Like, how would you coach me to start to change those narratives that I don't even know are there because they're just running all the time in the background. It's yeah. kind of like the water I'm swimming in tells me these things and I don't even hear them. Yeah. Well, f- figuring out what those voices are, what they actually are saying to each individual person is definitely the first part. Cause we l- just listed like a dozen of them and some of them are going to be louder for different people. For me, when I was starting my business, it was really, I don't know enough, mm. which is crazy because I'm such a like a researcher and like acquirer and assimilator of knowledge that, that I didn't know enough to help anyone was kind of an insane thing to believe in, but I really believed in it. So the first part is really asking them enough questions to figure out what that thing is. And oftentimes when we're talking about whatever project we're creating or what we're working on, I'll hear the words that they say to themselves under their breath, or the belief will just come out, but what about this? And it's like, okay, well now we've zeroed in on something and we take a deeper look at it. And that can look a lot of different ways in my work with my clients. Sometimes it's a guided meditation. I bring back in those hypnotherapy skills that I used to use. I also use the tools of access consciousness, which are verbal processing, basically clearing statements that allow us to squash the energy of that belief. And then we replace it with the new belief or what we Mm. actually want to have replace that limitation with Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. something more positive. We literally change the language from I can't, or I'll use mine. I don't know enough to, I know more than enough to help people. Mm. And then we try to find a way to anchor that in, make a practice sometimes that will anchor that into their life and become their new reality Mm. and allow that to be where they're existing and where they're creating from now. Mm. What do you think of the concept of fake it till you make it? I think if the fake it till you make it is 
actively changing the language inside of you. If you're faking it, like I can do this, but there's still a loud voice in your head saying you can't, then the fake it till you make it isn't quite going to take hold. But if you can actually catch yourself, this is a daily process. And I know lots of people talk about mindset, but you are talking to yourself in your head and maybe out loud, like I do, um, all the time. Mm. And if you can hear, if you can begin to be aware enough to perceive Mm. where that language is in Mm. your everyday life, in everywhere you're showing up in all of your interactions, even in how you talk to other cars in traffic Mm. and catch those moments and reframe and, and like rewire, reprogram yourself through your language, through your words, through neuro-linguistic programming to change the thought to a better feeling thought, change the thought to a more positive outcome oriented thought or, or saying or sentence, it will change your reality. Mm. Changing the way you speak, the way you uh, talk to yourself, the way you interact with the world, with language and with your energy will change your reality. And Mm. I think the first part is really being willing to notice when those words come out. Like when you say, I can't, or I don't have enough money. Well, I'm becoming someone who has enough money to do this. Mm. I I do. It's funny because, okay, so I've been getting on calls. I'm testing, you know, I'm kicking the tires of our own product, my literary cart. So I'm getting on calls with people hearing their stories and I cannot tell you, and I I'm typically coaching women because my literary cart is for female creators And how often they will say, I'm not good at sales. I'm not good at this. And I always say, wait, yet. And I make them say it back to me. I'm not good at sales yet. Or I'm not good at whatever it is yet. And all of a sudden, that tiny little word opens the space for the possibility that I am maybe on a journey and I might not be there yet, but I'm on my way. Right. And I can see like they laugh like that when I go yet. And then they kind of laugh. It feels light to open up to possibilities. There's a lightning of it, which is why it's fun to do once you get into it. Yeah. And And I would follow that up because I, I'm not good at sales yet is the like first breath of like, Oh wait. And then you can sort of steamroll on that or it's like, I'm willing to believe that I could be good at sales. I'm actually somebody who's definitely smart enough to be good at sales. I am becoming someone who's good at sales. Like it has a progression that you can sort of steamroll. And the energy of that is so vibrant Mm. and enlivening Mm. that, yeah, I don't know why we don't get hooked on that more, but I'm hoping we're becoming a society who gets hooked on that more. So what I hear you saying, tell me if this is right. Yeah, We have these tapes that are running all the time in our heads that we're not aware of. And if you can sit down with yourself and quiet yourself or sit down with somebody like you, Molly, and really go, what are these tapes running? That's step one, because you don't even know they're there. You know, that you walk by a mirror and go, I'm fat without even knowing that you're saying that, or I'm stupid, or nobody loves me, or whatever those tapes are, we're not even conscious of them. And yet, I'm a huge believer thought is creative. So, what you think is ultimately what you create. And it's not even just because, like, I think to myself, I'm going to make chocolate chip cookies, and then I go make chocolate chip cookies. It's deeper than that. Mm -hmm. So, it is these, you know, messages that we are continually getting. So, you're saying the first step is just uncovering what they are. Awareness of it. Yeah. In the first place. Then it seems like noticing, and this is so tricky because you have to be having a a mind that's stepping out of yourself so that they're not just running all the time, but that you go, oh my God, I did it again there. You know, I mean, I'm stupid. Oh, you know, or I don't even know, but you, you notice it and you catch it. And those are, that's hard. It's hard to it catch starts it. out hard and it gets easier the more you do it because you suddenly start to build in this sort of checking awareness. It, the awareness grows the more you do it. And then it seems like, oh my God, I just said I'm stupid. <gasps> am I, am I? And then you kind of go in there and you go, let's examine this. 
If I were stupid, then maybe I couldn't have done my, you know, I couldn't have gone to college or I couldn't have built a business or I couldn't have created whatever, you know, my family or who knows what things I've solved in my life. And so you start to kind of challenge the belief to go, whoa, I have evidence and the evidence is not lining up with this narrative. Totally. Yeah. And the logical brain, the mind, the judgmental side of your mind that is creating that negative story in the first place, very much honors the data of that evidence. So if you can look for evidence and, or even feedback from this reality that says that's not actually the truth, the ultimate absolute truth, that part of your brain actually listens to that kind of data. So if I say nobody loves me and then I go, well, you know, my husband, he at least says he loves me and he my child, like your daughter definitely probably. Yes. Yeah. Like you know, and does. you go, wait a second. Like she gave me like flowers on mother's day. Like that's evidence. Like start with like the basics. Yeah. Like she wouldn't be hugging me if she didn't love me. So I think I need to re-examine that, that my view of the world is through a prism And it's the kind of thing we all see the world through a prism. So why not pick a better prism? Yeah. New lens. Definitely. You know, it's not like I'm seeing the world as the world. I'm seeing the world through my own filters. So why not? Now, do I need to figure out like, it was my father who said that message back when I was three and somehow it stuck. Like, do I have to go back to, I don't think you need to like cause everything. No, no, I don't think it's necessary. I think if, if it's something that just won't shift that you just can't get to the other side of, it can be helpful to look at where did this come from and look at even in that moment, was it actually true that you were not loved? Probably not. Mm -hmm. And then bring that state. I mean, there's timeline therapy, there's, um, hypnotherapy goes into those root cause moments for sure also, but I don't think it's always required. And what Mm. it really is about is neuroplasticity Mm. that our brains have a pathway that they're used to going up and it started very young Mm -hmm. and that pathway of I'm stupid or I'm not good enough or whatever. It's well-trodden. It's a beaten path. And to start navigating off of that path, to start saying, wait, 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 actually, my daughter seems like she loves me a lot. I might actually be lovable. That might actually be a new truth. And I'm, I'm becoming someone who believes that I'm lovable. And that leads, you know, further down Mm -hmm. that rampage is Mm -hmm. I am loved. Mm -hmm. I love me. I Mm -hmm. am love. Mm -hmm. It can keep going that way. And the more we course correct, the more we become aware of something, look for evidence that a different thing is true write the new story, we're basically bushwhacking up a new path in our neural pathways. And that's Mm -hmm. neuroplasticity. We have the plasticity to change that course and beat a new path. And once we've beaten a new path, our neurology, our actual ability to have a thought is more capable of choosing one over the other. At first, the beaten path is going to keep being the one we're going down. And over time, we create that new path and it becomes easier to access. And I, I would add to that, We like staying safe. So even if the beaten path is super destructive, everything in our biology and our body is going to want to push us down. Those, it's like the devil you know is better than the devil you don't. So if in fact you're like, this is stupid, it's never going to work, or I really am not lovable or whatever it is, know that that's weirdly your own biology trying to protect you, even though it's doing the wrong thing. Because yeah. going down the path of like, maybe I'm lovable, or maybe I'm worthy, or maybe I'm not stupid, or whatever it is, is a really, it, it's scary to go down these paths. Like they seem like, no, 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 those are like the love paths. But just know that if you're, you've stayed safe, like you're alive, your biology thinks you're alive because these paths are working for you. So don't be surprised if all of a sudden you start to change your narrative and then you go, this is so dumb. It's never going to work or whatever, that that's really weirdly this cross current that's happening. Right. And there's so many reinforcements to keep you the way you were. It's unknown. It's uncomfortable because it's unknown to go into a new direction. I mean, how many of your friendships, let's say you are friends with people who don't like themselves and who complain about their lives a lot. If you start loving yourself and loving your life, 
it's going to be uncomfortable for them to hang out with you. And probably you're going to feel like a different person around them. And that's going to create some tension. And then you're worried you might lose your friends. Like there's so many places where we're reinforced to be who we've always been Mm -hmm. instead of becoming who we know we can be. Absolutely. They talk about that with people in recovery, that their friends typically shift because those friends that were their friends were also keeping them in addiction and that yeah. like, it's a big overhaul to start to do this work. So it is, ri- it, it isn't for the, um, the faint of heart is what I would say. It's not just like a path to like, woo happiness, you know, puppies and rainbows it's work. It's work. Yeah. But it's worth it because the, on the other side of it is more joy and more of you and more power and more for those of us who are working with like powerful entrepreneurs, more success, more impact, Mm. more Mm. changing of the world. Mm. And that matters. That's worth a little discomfort and a rearranging of one's life sometimes to step into the change that you're capable of creating in this world. So if there were narratives that you would recommend people start to internalize when you see successful entrepreneurs, what would you say those narratives are? If you see someone having the life or the business that you'd like to have, instead of why can't I, or who are they to, the mantra is I'll have what they're having. Mm. You see something you like out in the world, instead of jealousy and envy, I'll have what they're having. That's like telling the universe, hey, I've made my order. I'm receiving whatever that is. I think I want to receive over there. I'll take some of that. Thank you. And then just like you would at a restaurant, assume that that order is enough to start bringing that to you. Do you start to dissect what that other person is doing? I mean, you can, if we're talking business strategy and you like somebody's business model and you want to recreate it for yourself. I've done a lot of that with email marketing for sure. Okay. So be inspired by them. There's enoughness. There's room for both of us. Yes, definitely. The possibility, the prosperity consciousness of there's room for both of us is a big one. But yeah, I think to go back to the original concept is you are capable of anything. You can change any aspect of your life or yourself or your business that you want to. And believing that is true is the first step. And then starting to actually be willing to look at who am I now and who do I want to become and what's in the way of that right now? How can I start choosing to see it differently so that I can move towards more of that thing that I think I want, whether that's success, whether that's recognition, whether that's just more impact, more change and transformation that you're creating and facilitating to start choosing to make changes that move you in that direction. Mm. Molly, I just, I have to say, I think that this is so important because you can hire the VAs and put the systems in place and do all of that stuff. But if you don't have this foundational stuff in place, it's not necessarily going to work. And if you have this foundational stuff in place, it's much easier to layer on the systems and the click up and, you know, email marketing and have success. So I would say really like based on this discussion for everybody who's listening to take a a moment and step back and say, what are these negative beliefs that are holding me back? Isn't it worth it for me to start going down this path of, started like exploring this and it's really valuable to explore this even before you get onto Upwork. Yeah. And I also think that the inner work happens along the journey that you're going to come up against some of these limiting beliefs really loudly when you try to do something that you haven't done before. Mm -hmm. So it's okay to move in the direction of what you want to create and then notice when the belief shows up to say no. Mm and analyze that then. I don't think that that you have to go deep into some inner work to then be worthy of running your business the way you want to run it. I think they can happen at the same time. And I think you're right that they will bring up stuff that you you didn't even know was there. Totally. Especially anybody, the first time you go live on social media, if yeah. That's a pretty big moment of noticing what those voices are. I always say like the best way to work on yourself is to go start a business. Yeah. Because it will show you everything. Yeah. You cannot not evolve when you run a business. And you can't hide if if it's going to be successful. Like if you're willing to do what it takes, you will see stuff in yourself that you can't ignore anymore. Absolutely. Okay. Molly, if people want to 
learn more about you, see what you offer, become part of your community, where should they go? Yes. Wildheartsriseup.com is my website. That's wildhearts with an S rise up.com. Um, great places to get started on there are, I have two podcasts. One is called tactical magic, the business strategies podcast for the warrior goddess entrepreneur. The other is called reveal the game of life. If you're not necessarily interested in the entrepreneur side of things or healing, that's just a podcast about consciousness and waking up to the game of life that we're playing. Mm. And there's also two quizzes on my website, one for thought leaders, one that's just about peace with money. And you'll find your money flavor and a fancy recipe of what to do with that inner money mindset monologue that we've got going. Um, The thought leader quiz will give you a tarot archetype to notice about your life as an entrepreneur. Well, I love that. Well, I have to say, this has been really delightful. You've given me a lot to think about. And I just want to say thank you for coming on the show. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks everyone for listening. I hope you guys like this episode. I really enjoyed my conversation with Molly. I like that we got to dig into mindset stuff, limiting beliefs, and how to chip away at them. I think running your own business is an act of courage. So I want to say kudos to all of you out there who are in the process of doing this. Before I go, I want to encourage you to go to milotreecart.com, sign up for your free account, and start building your digital product empire. Also, if you are enjoying the podcast, after this ends, would you head to iTunes or wherever you listen and please give the podcast five stars. It is such a great way for others to find it and to help build this awesome community of creators. And I will see you here again next week. (laughs) 